Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Happy New Year. (laughs) If you are new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm also excited, as usual, to be continuing in our Corinthian series. This is where we're looking at the biblical books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, letters actually from Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth, where... They're experiencing issues. So many that some have asked the question, are we any different today than those crazy Corinthians? Before we begin this morning, I want to talk about a few things. First of all, if you don't know about it, if you haven't heard about it, our app. There's an app for that here at C3 Church. It is C3 Church in your pocket. We can do a lot of things on that app. Heather will talk about that later for the purposes of the message You can look at my sermon notes if you care to in there. I have a lot of stuff to say, but only about a half hour or so to say it on a Sunday morning, so I put all the extra stuff in there. In addition, our midweek Bible study application questions are in there. Everyone's welcome to come to the Wednesday night Bible study upstairs, 6 p.m. It's for everyone. Even if you've never read the Bible before, you will be comfortable there. It's because we talk about application, how to apply all of these things. And that's no different whether you've been a Christian for many years or you're just starting out. The application is the same. So you're all welcome to come. I hope you will join us. View these things as extensions of what we talk about on a Sunday morning, how we live it out throughout the week so that we're not just Sunday to Sunday Christians. Also, I want to thank my friend Lance. He held down the fort quite well last week. He acted as my substitute teacher, and indeed, you guys acted just as students do when there's a sub. (laughs) You talked in class. I watched the message. (laughs) Now, I don't have to rebuke you. He did a good job of doing that himself. And as he noted, we do have a lot of cool conversations. We get together and talk theology a lot. We are part of the theological nerd herd, so to speak. We have a lot of fun. I want to thank him. He did a great job. I hope we can have him back very soon. Also, this is really important. It's National Whipped Cream Day. It's a a real thing. I'm not lying to you. National Whipped Cream Day. It's also, I got to read this because I'm going to get it wrong. No Pants Subway Ride Day. That is a real thing. No Pants Subway ride day. Kind of difficult to do here in Naples. I don't think we have a subway. (laughs) It'd be underwater. Now, here's the thing. If you celebrate these two holidays, you will definitely be blowing your New Year's resolution. So I just don't advise that you do that. And if you put these two things together in your imagination in a creative way, that's on you, not me. Moving along. We find ourselves in 2 Corinthians today, the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, the first Sunday of the new year. Today's topic will be suffering and how we find comfort in that suffering as Christians. That's really where we're going to hang today, talking about where we find our comfort, where we should and shouldn't find comfort. We've talked about suffering pretty recently, and so I just want to point you to certain books of the Bible. I'm just going to touch on it. It is important to touch on it, especially because here in America, we have something called the prosperity gospel, prosperity doctrine. And it can be pretty bad, especially here in America, because the Bible just simply doesn't teach that when you read it in context. Jesus never said, sign up for this, and it's going to be really easy. Never. He never said that. So we have to deal with it because a lot of people fall away from the faith due to this. The teaching goes something like this, is that Christians were promised through the Bible by God, by Jesus, that we're always to be healthy and wealthy. It's always what's going to happen. And it's your lack of faith that causes you not to be. It's wrong. What happens is when, (laughs) when something bad happens to you, you begin to question your faith or the reality of God himself, and many people fall away. That's not what the writers of the New Testament did. It wasn't their objective. In fact, they thought that the tribulation was coming sooner than later, and so they wrote to prepare their followers for it. Get ready. 
It's going to happen. So instead of arguing about it, I'm going to let God do the talking. I'm going to point you to certain books of the Bible if you believe this, if you've heard this, or if you want to refute this. The way you come up with it, if you're trying to teach like that, is by taking verses out of context. Cherry picking verses. That's how it happens. It's the only way it happens. You're supposed to read the entire books. Now, this can be hard, right? Matthew, 28 chapters, that's going to take a long time. I'm going to point you to books of the Bible that are easy reads. So, Philippians. If you know me, you know that that's probably my favorite book of the entire Bible. There, it talks about the character and nature of Jesus Christ and that he suffered. Paul, who wrote it, talks about sharing in Christ's sufferings. It's crystal clear. If you read it cover to cover, all four chapters, there's no way if you have good reading comprehension skills, you're going to come away with a prosperity doctrine or prosperity gospel. Four chapters, average reader, 15 to 20 minute read. Simple. First Thessalonians, there's another one. We're going to talk about Thessalonica or Thessaloniki if you're speaking Greek. They experience a lot of persecutions. Paul writes to them about that. Another pretty quick read, five chapters. First Peter, another five-chapter book. He prepares the followers for suffering. Second Timothy. We're going to look at First Timothy today, but specifically Second Timothy. That's written toward the end of Paul's life. He's in prison. Certainly not prosperity doctrine. You're also going to read about a guy towards the end, Trophimus, who gets so sick that Paul has to leave him in Miletus. We see him in Acts 20 as well. So whether it be persecution or sickness, we as Christians got to deal with it. It happens, and it's not for lack of faith. We will talk about that today. Again, Jesus never said this would be easy. I talked about this a couple, two, three weeks ago. Maybe I said what Jesus said. What was the prerequisite for following Jesus? He warned everybody, deny yourself. Pick up your cross, then follow me. There are a couple of extra little steps he gave there. A lot of people like to ignore that. He never said, you're going to have all this wealth. I want you to accumulate as much wealth as you can here on earth. And then, oh, by the way, as you follow me, the street will be paved with gold too, and everything will be easy downhill both ways. Said Jesus never. Today's focus is how we find comfort when these things happen to us? How do we deal with it as Christians? Lance, last week, he mentioned that we can find comfort through the church, through godly companionship, through each other. That's good and that's true. Today, we're going to look at some other ways, godly ways, that we can find comfort, and we're going to look at some of the ways we probably shouldn't be finding it. we got to deal with that. So first, let's look at the text, 2 Corinthians. Chapter 1 starting at verse 3. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so through Christ our comfort also overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is experienced in your endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you will share in the comfort. If that doesn't make my previous point any more clear, I don't know what does. Good comfort comes from God through his body, the church, as Lance spoke about last week. We also find comfort in other things of God. I'm going to talk about a couple of those things. First, the hope of the resurrection, that Jesus rose from the dead, so we will too. I talked about Thessalonica. They're experiencing a lot of persecutions there. In fact, when Paul, Silas, and Timothy Timothy or Sylvanus, they arrive there, we see it in Acts 17, it's rough. They get chased out of town. They treat his friend Jason pretty badly. But people still come to the faith. A church gets planted there. And they experience persecution. Through that, 
Paul writes to them to encourage them, and look what he encourages them with. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep or have died, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see here that the people who are being persecuted, experiencing death, grieving, are being given comfort from Paul through the words of God, through the promise of the resurrection. And he's telling them, encourage one another with this promise, with the word of God. We find comfort in the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him in my name and he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. This is Jesus speaking. Now the word Counselor there in Greek is parakletos. Not to be confused with parakletos, which I think is Spanish for parakete. I'm not sure. (laughs) Just seeing if you're still paying attention. I don't want to lose you in the Greek here. I told you I was going to talk about parakeets today. Um, Yeah. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, the word comfort there, that's the Greek word under that. So, another fair translation that appears in some translations is, but the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Father will send him in my name. So, we're going to talk about that comfort a little bit more, but here's what we got to do first. We want to look at some practical ways that we can apply that. But, as we enter a new year, I think it's important to take a look at some of the ways, maybe last year, (laughs) we've been finding comfort. What things we've been going to for comfort that we can go to, as we'll discuss in certain ways, at the right time, the right place, the right amount. (laughs) But ultimately, we don't want to stop there. We don't want to just rely on those things and those things only to find our comfort. So we're going to look at it. We're going to take a practical look at things. This is what real church real people is all about. It's about taking the mask off, getting honest about what we're dealing with here, not pretending, not being Sunday to Sunday Christians. So Paul, he wrote about some of these things in 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to use 1 Corinthians as the text that we're going to go to, because if you've been with us, you should be somewhat familiar with it. If you've been reading your Bible, New Year's resolution. So, Three of these things that those crazy Corinthians were dealing with, that Paul was dealing with, we're dealing with two today. So we're going to pick three that we wrestle with. Ripping off the band-aid. Food, sex, and alcohol. These are three things that we go to for comfort still today. That are very difficult. Why? Because we can have them at the right times and places. So, when we go to them for comfort, we're flirting with a potential mistake every single time. Two of them are a little easier because we don't need them. One of them is very difficult for some because we need it. We flirt with it all the time. We can do these things in the guardrails by their originally intended purposes. But, at the right time and place. So, let's look at the text from 1 Corinthians. Sex, when can we have that? Everybody just got really uncomfortable there. It's like when I talked about porn. (laughs) It's okay, calm down. Within marriage, within the confines of a good godly marriage. Paul talks about it, 1 Corinthians 7, starting at verse 1. He writes, Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have relations with a woman. So I've talked about this in the past. There's correspondence, they're writing back and forth. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital responsibility to his wife and likewise a wife to her husband. 
A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but the wife does. You see the equality there. Do not deprive one another sexually, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Remember that. I'm going to go back to that later. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So we see here, Paul outlines it. Don't deprive one another so that your eyes don't wander somewhere else. You might desire someone else unless you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. We'll touch on that again later. So sex is okay within the confines of a godly marriage. Alcohol. When? Well, Paul says, at home and in moderation. We talked about the Lord's Supper when we were in 1 Corinthians 11, so I'll give you the context and the background here. Remember, if you were with us, I talked about the church. We can't think of the ancient church the way we think of church today, either in the modern context, like in here, or like the traditional church. Not like that. They were meeting in homes due to persecution. So they would have like kind of these banquet type areas where I talked about the triclinium and then people would be kind of leading worship or whatever in the middle prophesying. Well, they're having the Lord's Supper and they're treating it like secular banquets. They're going a little nuts. So he says this, therefore, when you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper ahead of others. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Do you, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? I'm just imagining that going on here. So Paul doesn't say, don't drink. He's upset because they're getting drunk, and they're getting drunk during a worship service, essentially in church. So he says, go do that at home. <laughs> That's not what church is for. Look what he writes to Timothy. It's kind of an interesting passage of Scripture. 1 Timothy 5.23. He writes, Paul, don't continue drinking only water, but use a little wine because of your stomach and frequent illnesses. So I want to make a note here on that suffering. This is interesting. I think Lance noted it last week, right? Timothy is Paul's right-hand man. What's he doing getting sick if we're not supposed to suffer? He's a high up elder in the church at Ephesus. And note something, he has frequent illnesses. Problems with his stomach, too. That in the Greek there is and. That is a very good rendering of the text. It varies in other versions of the Bible. Holman Christian gets it right there. Stomach and frequent illnesses. Notice something. He doesn't say, Timothy, get your faith game straight. That's not what he says. And people don't have any problem saying that when that's the case in the Bible. Mark 9. This is what Jesus says disciples regarding the demon-possessed boy they couldn't cast out. It's because of your faith you couldn't do it. So if that were the issue, Paul would have said it. Yo, Tim, <laughs> you got a little problem with your faith. You're getting sick a little too much. No. Remember Trophimus? Left them sick. They were getting sick. And Miletus. So there's something else going on there. But notice something. A little a little wine, <laughs> all right? So we have to think of this here as like medicinal. Back then, if you don't know, water would be dirty quite often, a lot of bacteria in it. So they would mix the wine in there. Maybe the alcohol kills the bacteria or they would just drink wine. It wasn't really like the wine that we drink today. It was probably pretty watered down. So we see that in the Bible, we, we use alcohol or they used alcohol for both merriment and medication. That wasn't the case, Jesus, God wouldn't have made wine. <laughs> In John's Gospel account, chapter 2, what does he do? At the request of his mom, he makes wine. Where? At a wedding. It's for merriment. He wouldn't have made it if it wasn't allowed. But the Bible teaches we need to have it if we do in moderation. If we can't, it's got to go. No bueno. That's for the Spanish translator there. So, it is not a sin to have sex within marriage or to drink a little wine. It's all right. Only one of these things is necessary. If you're doing one of the others at the wrong time and place, you can get rid of it, still survive. What about the food, though? It can be dangerous. So, 
We need to exercise self-control in discipline. That's the key there. We saw also in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, remember the context was meat sacrificed to idols. So as Paul is talking about this, the meat sacrificed to idols, that you can have. He says this, 1 Corinthians 8, 13, Therefore, if food causes my brother to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother to fall or stumble, some versions say. Then goes on to talk about his right to take pay. He says, I have the right to take pay, but I'm not doing it. He's showing up the false teachers. Why? Well, for the sake of the gospel. That's another context that we have in there. It's about Paul, or us too, by extension, giving up things for the sake of the gospel. That's primary. So he says this, another interesting verse, 1 Corinthians 9.27. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Whoa, you don't hear a lot of preachers say that on a Sunday morning. Interesting. We, especially preachers and pastors, need to take a long, hard look at that verse. Paul takes it seriously, and so should we. I've said it recently that we should definitely consider that Jesus began his public ministry by doing what? Fasting. He fasted, got baptized, and then fasted. And I don't think the discipline of fasting is talked about enough in the modern church. Fasting is one thing we may want to consider as we make New Year's resolutions. It doesn't have to be 40 days. <laughs> I don't know if I could make it that long. But it could be intermittent fasting, maybe skipping a meal here and there, getting some discipline. Practical keys. Let's be practical this morning. You can get help from your church. You can get an accountability partner if that's what you need. Our staff, we've decided to do kind of like a weight loss challenge. It's really not that because it's not a competition and I didn't make them do it. <laughs> we all voted on it. Unanimously, we decided, yes, it would be really nice to keep each other accountable. Weigh in at staff meetings. Start getting this right. Why? Well, they fasted in the Bible. Why should we ignore that? We kind of shouldn't. Jesus did it. Health reasons. We know that when we're closer to our ideal weight, we're in better health. We're more productive and we achieve better clarity. We're thinking better. That would be good. Also, church leadership. Look at the verse again, right? We want to lead by example. Paul has no problem. Philippians, check it out. Read that book. Pointing to Timothy and Epaphroditus as examples that they should follow. Follow their examples. We're examples to you. So if we're trying to lead by example... Kind of should be trying to do what Jesus did. And Jesus went on a diet. Just saying. So are we. So the next logical question is this. During the wrong time or place for these things, how do we beat the urges? Urges. Urge with a Z. How do we overcome the temptation? Good question. Thanks for asking. Practically, this is tough. If we're being honest, we need to fall out of love with those things. We need to have a greater desire for Jesus than we do. Food, sex, and alcohol. He needs to be the go-to, not these other things. We need to center ourselves in Christ and be led by a couple of things. These are the keys. What did Jesus do? His example. What did he do? Let's look. Matthew 4, starting at verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, I bet. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But he answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was fasting, but he says his reliance was on the Word of God. It's interesting to think about. 
sure you've all heard this. You are what you eat. Well, we also ingest things that we look at and listen to into our minds. We digest it in there. We start thinking about it. It becomes, whether we know it or not, a part of us. What are we looking at on TV? The internet. Are those things provoking us to do things, or at the very least, have thoughts about them? It's kind of interesting. We need to spend more time in God's Word in prayer than looking at or listening to things that maybe we shouldn't. So if your thing is food, cooking shows, not a good idea. Not going to help you at all. <laughs> well, you know that. <laughs> your thing is sex, porn, no good. Well, look at that stuff. If the thing is drinking, don't watch Cheers, just saying. <clears throat> so, using me as an example, I work from home a lot. I get a lot more done at home than here. Nobody bothers me. So, I can get a lot of my sermon work done, a lot of my reading done. It's quiet, that's why. But if you're me, that can be bad sometimes. I have ringing in my ears, tinnitus, tinnitus, whatever you want to call it, probably from the 80s and 90s, and Marshall Fullstacks, playing them way too loud. Not good. So I like white noise at home, right? Otherwise I go a little crazy. Er, than I am. <clears throat> so I found a cool thing that I'll share with you, because what I came up with at first was not good. I didn't know it right away until my wife pointed it out, like pretty much everything else in my life. I turned on the news. And it was making me nervous. There's a lot of negativity on the news. I'm not going to make any political jokes. Stop right there. But it can be very negative. It was making me anxious. Heather noted it. She would come home. There'd be a contrast. She's listening to her music in the car. She comes home and it's like, ugh. It's just a mess, this filth, this nastiness. I thought, it took me like two months to realize it too. I was like, yeah, you know, maybe I need to listen to something else. So I have Netflix. That's one of the uh, uh, services that Heather subscribes to that she had to like match the tithing with. She was honest about that. That was kind of funny. On there, there are four really cool movies, and that's it. <clears throat> Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John, Gospel of Mark. And they're really cool. A lot of times we watch like Bible shows and they're a little cheesy. No, these are really neat. The actors are there or, or from that region. And a guy with a really cool British accent does the narration. He just simply reads the Bible, reads the gospel account. It's really good. The only thing that can make it better is if Morgan Freeman were the narrator. <laughs> then I'd be really relaxed. I like to fall asleep to Morgan Freeman. He's got a great voice. Plus he played God, didn't he? Bruce Almighty. <laughs> so anyway, it's really good. And I'll tell you the truth, I find myself a little more relaxed when I'm listening to that. I'm getting comfort from the Word of God. See how that works? All I had to do was change the channel. Prayer. What did Lance say Jesus did in the garden? You guys were quiet on that one. He criticized you. He's like, now you're quiet? What did Jesus say? You didn't know. He prayed. He got comfort from God the Father. He prayed. He didn't want to go to the cross, right? He said, take this cup from me. If it's possible, nope. Okay, thy will be done. The ultimate example of discipline and obedience. Unbelievable. He prayed to get comfort. Remember what I mentioned about Mark chapter 9 and the disciples not being able to heal out the demon-possessed boy. Jesus said, it's for their lack of prayer and fasting that they couldn't cast it out. So right afterward, this is what it says, Mark 9, 28. After Jesus went into a house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive the demon out? And Jesus told them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Why is fasting in brackets? Because it's not in the oldest manuscripts. I just wanted to be transparent about that. But it is strong Christian tradition we know that Jesus did fast. What's that all about? It's about total reliance on God, not on us. And that includes surrender. If we're going to be whatever demons are plaguing us, we need to do what Jesus did. We need to surrender. We need to get our prayer life right. 
we may want to consider fasting. It involves removing things that are polluting us, cleaning out our temples. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, preparing for holiness, preparing our bodies for something that is worthy of the Holy Spirit, great comforter. Receiving the Holy Spirit requires surrender. That's it. It's not something we do to get him to come into our lives. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and the one by which the most powerful demons, the most powerful demons, the ones who are controlling us to do the things we ought not to do, we cannot get rid of them ourselves. It's done by the power of God and by the power of God only. I will say this. Successful sobriety stories almost always include surrender. That's when it happens. I know a lot of people in active recovery, and they all tell me the same thing. You know, when I got right, I just gave it to God. I gave it to God. And if that's you today, that's my prayer and encouragement to you. Stop trying to do it on your own. It doesn't work. You have to surrender and give it to God. Ask the Lord for help. Get your prayer life right. Center yourselves on the things of Jesus. Ask Him for help. Additionally, by extension, His body, the church, that's what we're here for. So if you're just a little bit further ahead than somebody, look behind you. <laughs> Offer a hand. And if you're struggling, it's okay. You've heard Heather's story. She was very transparent with y'all. We have a lot of people who have successful sobriety stories and we're happy to share with you. What I want to do with the last minute or so I have is I want to pray for us as a church. I want to pray for me I want to pray for you, us as a church. Let's pray. Lord, first of all, we thank you. We thank you for this church, for the opportunities that are before us, not just this morning, the ones we're going to be walking into this week. We ask, take the blinders off. Let the scales drop from our eyes so that we can better see what your will is for us. Lord, we surrender to you. We pledge to turn from the things that are not of you and draw more of our attention to you, Lord, to your will for us, not our will be done, but your will be done done, Lord. We know that ultimately our citizenship is in heaven, not here on earth. Yet for the time that we are here, let us be a blessing to those around us. I pray for more successful sobriety stories so that we can Tell of all the great things that you're doing in this church, through this church, in this city, for our neighbors around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Thank you.